Tales from the Break Room is a viewer submission podcast, and I want to hear your scariest work story. So send it to me at eeriecast.com slash submit, and if it ends up on the show, I'll pay you five cents per word via PayPal. Don't forget to follow and rate my new show, Camping Horrors, for more outdoorsy scares. Thanks. Hi, welcome to Dead and Roasted. What can I get you? Too bad I work in the coffee business. No chance of working from home here. What would I do, mail people's macchiatos through the post office? Well, luckily for me, and unluckily for this guy, maybe working from home isn't all it's cracked up to be. You see, I heard a story recently about someone who worked from home, only to be harassed by something sinister way out in the middle of nowhere. Look at that, it's break time and I've got plenty more true scary work stories to share. Join me and bring your croissant. These are tales from the break room. Working from home horror from Jay Elliott. It's been over a year now since the bizarre incident that happened while I was working from home one day. I still get uneasy when I think back on it. At the time, my wife and I were living in an old farmhouse in rural Missouri that we had fixed up ourselves. It was on 20 acres of land out in the middle of nowhere. The closest neighbor was a mile down the road. I worked remotely as a software developer while my wife worked in the city, about 40 minutes away. She was out of town for a business conference when all this went down. At the time, it was just me and our dogs, a pit bull and a German shepherd. It started out as a normal work day. I was sitting in my home office, which looks out onto our backyard, through large windows. The dogs were taking a nap nearby as I typed away at my computer. It was a sunny fall day, leaves just starting to change colors. Everything was quiet and still. After I had been working for a couple of hours, I heard the first unusual noise. It sounded like metal clanging outside. I paused and looked out the window, but nothing seemed amiss. The dogs perked up too at the noise, but then settled back down after a moment when it didn't repeat. I assumed something had fallen over in the shed, so I went back to work. Over the next hour or so, I kept hearing strange sounds outside the office. More clanging, some odd thumping noises, faint rustling in the fallen leaves. Every time I would stop to listen, but then there would be dead silence. No wind, no animals, and nothing to explain what I was hearing. I decided to take a quick break. I stepped out onto the back deck to get some fresh air. That's when I noticed one of the wooden chairs on the lawn and a rake were lying in the middle of the yard. Neither had been there earlier. I called the dogs out and we searched around the house together but still, we found nothing out of the ordinary. The noises had stopped, so I shrugged it off and went back to work. Another 30 minutes went by, and I started to hear the clanging and rustling again, this time louder and seemingly closer to the house. I was genuinely confused about what could be making that racket. Again, we didn't have any nearby neighbors. Strangest of all, the dogs were calm, just lying there, casually sniffing the air. I got up and looked outside again, walking the perimeter of the house. At the back corner of the property, I found some broken tree branches and divots in the dirt. It appeared as if something had trampled the ground recently. The back of my neck prickled as I realized these weren't just random noises. Something or someone was in fact lurking around the house messing with things and scurrying off before I could spot it. I went back inside, this time locking all the doors before grabbing my revolver. I sat down, watching out the office windows, my gun in my lap. I felt stupid. Maybe I'm just paranoid, I thought. I mean, the dogs were still lounging around, oblivious to any strange goings on. I listened hard, but everything was still silent. After 15 minutes with no activity, I was just thinking I should get back to work. 
when I heard a loud crash. Something heavy smashed to the ground at the front of the house. I jumped up, running down the hallway, pistol raised. The dogs finally really reacted, barking and running toward the front door ahead of me. Looking through the front curtains, I could see our large clay planter had been knocked over. Dirt and flowers had been dumped on the front walkway. The wooden bench from the porch was now down in the yard. My heart raced. I unlocked the door, telling the dogs to stay back. With my gun out, I slowly circled the house. That's when I froze. At the corner of the house, the ground had been disturbed. Still fresh claw marks had dug into the dirt. They trailed off behind the house. And near those marks were three dark feathers, each as long as my hand. I gulped and turned to follow where they led. Making my way into the backyard, I could see more feathers and scratched up ground, heading toward the tree line. That stretch of woods beyond our lawn suddenly took on a sinister vibe. Every shadow seemed to move as I stared at the feathers scattered before it. My adrenaline was really pumping now. I shook my head, realizing I needed to get back inside and call someone about this. I sure as heck wasn't about to go into those woods alone. As I turned back toward the house, a freakishly loud screech rang out. It echoed and seemed to come from the sky and the trees at the same time. I'll never forget that sound, like metal grinding and twisting, with a shriek that shook through to my bones. The dogs whimpered and cowered behind me. I hurled myself back inside, slamming the door shut behind the dogs. I peeked through the curtains, expecting to see some creature emerge from the woods, but there was nothing. My hands were shaking as I dialed for the police. I didn't know who else to call. I can only imagine what I sounded like trying to explain some disturbing things lurking outside my rural home. Dispatch said they would send a patrol car to check things out. In the meantime, I sat there, watching out the windows with the dogs by my side. I felt completely helpless, jumping at every little sound while waiting for the cops. It took almost half an hour for the patrol car to finally show up. Two officers searched the property while I showed them the strange disturbances and feathers. They drove a ways down the road to my neighbors and knocked on their door, but no one was home. In the end, the officers had no explanation for what had uprooted items and made that horrible screeching sound. They took the feathers as possible evidence and filed a report but with no sighting of an actual creature or person, there wasn't much else they could do. They told me to call immediately if there were any more incidents. They left to respond to a car accident in town. I was a nervous wreck the rest of that day and night, barricading myself indoors. Eventually, I had to go pick my wife up from the airport the next day. We stayed at a hotel nearby overnight, which helped to calm my nerves before going back to our house. Even so, I would jump at the slightest noise outside, imagining that shriek splitting the air and what it may have come from. I still have no idea what was prowling around our home. Those massive feathers didn't belong to any local birds. I can hardly stand being there by myself these days. We would eventually put the house on the market, and I soon found a job in the city. I hate to think what might have happened if I'd gone into those woods. Crash Crawlies from Tesuzanko I bounced between a number of fast food positions when I was younger. As weird as it might seem, a certain luxury feel came to surround indoor playground workplaces, especially when you were used to Burger King, Wendy's, and A&W like I was. I don't necessarily regret working those jobs, but the constant on your feet demanding role of a line cook at such positions weren't and never could be much fun. Crash Crawley's is about as close as you can get to a proprietary single location Chuck E. Cheese style restaurant. 
Really, it's an even worse business model. Because at least when I worked there a few years ago, our entire day-to-day -day general admissions weren't nearly as important for our income as the private parties were. We were able to upcharge parents a ridiculous amount to rent out the facility for a set number of hours. And so that's what made up the general weekend timetables. Unfortunately for me, I was on a full-time role, which means rather than managing a neat closed party for no more than eight kids, I had to deal with the random public access drop-ins. It was during the summer, so unassuming parents who had no other place to take their little tykes, now that school was out, would bring them to our establishment. Duties for me during the active hours consisted of making concessions, managing the floor, and on occasion presenting birthday cakes, because we indeed had weekday parties. Of course, they were hosted while the location was open for public business, which leads me to another rule, negotiating lonely and otherwise bored kids away from parties they didn't belong to, before they were able to make a dent in the snacks and cakes and birthday gifts that didn't belong to them. It's easy to complain about children being messy and loud at a job like that, but like I said before, the relatively slow pace was comfortable in its own right. Dealing with customers wasn't the only angle of the job. I worked full-time hours. I was one of the lucky few who got to open up the establishment in the mornings. No, this didn't mean I had to wake up at ungodly hours. The restaurant itself and indoor playground only opened up as early as 10 o'clock, so I was good to just arrive at around 8.45. It was an identical schedule to my college at the time, and simultaneously a shorter commute, so it worked fine for me. Morning duties were alright. I was almost always the only employee there, up until our regular opening hours, so it served as a nice little bit of alone time before the loud and somewhat chaotic day began. I had over an hour to do no more than 25 minutes of tasks, which included powering on the breakers for all the arcade hardware, a cleaning once-over, and preparing the kitchen. Typically, the latter two were always well handled by the staff who had closed the night before. They would do meal prep and leave appropriate proportions in our fridges and ensure the place was spotless before their night ended. When I started my sixth week at the position, however, this changed. I entered the facility that morning to find it disarrayed in a very bizarre fashion. The place had a main lobby when you entered, with a counter on one side and a few seats on the other. At the center was an admission-only gate. Behind that were the concession areas. At the very far wall was the indoor playground. That day, when I entered, I could see plainly over the admission gate that a large number of chairs were moved from the usual position tucked under the tables and were arranged in a circle at the center of the admission-only space. This was weird. I couldn't have imagined what kind of patron would ever want to arrange seating like that let alone a situation in which they'd be allowed to do it. There were exactly five chairs, all facing inwards in a circle. The space inside them, which the chairs looked towards, was no more than a meter or two in diameter. As I leaned over one of these chairs, I spotted what lay dead in the center, a small glittery object. I picked it up, examining it in my hands, only to find it was an earring, a plastic one, like a child's facsimile of one a woman might wear. I wasn't particularly mad about the situation. It only took a few minutes to bring the chairs back to where they belonged underneath the food tables, but I was definitely curious. Our organization back then used a WhatsApp group for communication, and so I sent a message asking what the deal was and why the chairs were left like that. It took maybe half an hour to get a reply, you really couldn't blame the closing shift for sleeping in. The message informed me that no one had any idea what I was talking about, that the place had been left in perfect condition, with the chairs where they should have been. I assumed they just had a lazy night and hadn't bothered to put the chairs back in their proper places. It still bugged me how they ended up like that in the first place, as the seating arrangement seemed rather purposeless. But I didn't push the issue. My day went on, nothing else was out of place, and so I completed the rest of the morning duties with no other items of note. As I finished my day, the earring I'd found, which I had placed into our lost and found, 
was yet to be claimed. Guess that made sense. It was obviously quite cheap, and I doubted if a child was missing it, the parent would bother bringing them back to the location to claim it. They would probably just get another set. I arrived the following morning to find an annoying sight. The chairs were, yet again, out of place. This time, the circle consisted of six chairs, not five, though everything else was identical, with the chairs lining up in a circular shape. This time when I checked, the center was occupied by a small plastic replica earring, just like before. Before fixing everything, I took a photograph of the chairs, texting it to my group chat as evidence of what I was talking about, asking why they were like this. I bent down, grabbing the little piece of jewelry, and working my way to the lost and found just behind the admissions desk. As I opened up the drawer where we normally store the small valuables in, I put the earring down and noticed it was identical to the one I'd found the day before. I then looked at both, noting that the only difference at all was the inversion of the symmetry, which meant they were the same set. This was even more curious. I placed the fake gems down together, I was going to text the chat again when I realized I wasn't sure how to convey the strangeness of finding two matching earrings in a seemingly specific spot back to back in few enough words, so I decided not to even bother. Instead, I dwelled on it as I went about my other duties. It seemed the most logical that the closing crew was pulling some weird prank on me, but that still seemed off because I hardly knew any of them. Besides, it took just as much work to move the chairs into their odd formation as it did to restore them to how they were supposed to be. So what was going on? I didn't come to learn anytime soon. Something a little bizarre did happen later that day, though. We had a large amount of kids that noon, irregular for a weekday. I think at peak there was a little over 10 groups present on the indoor playground. I remember slicing a pizza that I was about to serve, when I spotted something going on that immediately provoked my curiosity. There was a man, older and bald, present in between the many tables we had set up for food. Immediately, I didn't recognize him as someone who had come in earlier. He had a sort of disheveled look about him, not super out of place, but still odd, as you could tell he was lacking personal grooming. He had the attention of a few of the kids, so I thought he was a parent as he spoke to them. The kids then moved back to their table, but bizarrely, each removed one of the chairs from underneath the table, carrying them back to the man. I left the pizza unattended to walk over and inform them they shouldn't be moving establishment chairs around. As I looked on, though, I noticed the children were all independently moving the chairs into the form of a circle. The man was instructing them where to place each one, pointing with his finger. When it dawned on me they were putting together the same array of chairs that had popped up the last two mornings, I felt my heart sink. I didn't know what to think at first, even though the implications seemed to suggest that the man was probably responsible for the previous circular layouts, which indicated he'd somehow been in the establishment after closing. After letting that fact register, I approached him, clearing my throat and asking them what they thought they were doing. He stared at me idly, not replying, as if waiting for me to say something else. So I did. I informed him that chairs aren't to be moved from the tables, before specifically asking him why he was making that bizarre circle. The area was already cramped anyways, considering how many kids were present and eating, giving my authoritative complaint all the more validity. He looked at me, tilting his head slightly for a reason I wasn't sure of, before informing me that he was sorry. He waved his hand, and the children all at once, who had been standing about in a half circle behind each chair, looked at me, before taking the chairs back to the tables they'd taken them from. The entire scene was very off-putting. The man seemed strange in a way I couldn't quite place, and the kids were, well, odd. Not so much in and of themselves, but because of the way they seemed to blatantly follow this strange man's orders. Anyway, away went the chairs back to their original spots. As I returned to cutting the pizza I'd been working on, I thought about how the way they'd set up the chairs nearly exactly matched what I'd found in the restaurant the past two mornings. 
I brought the pie over to the table that was waiting for it, before deciding I wanted to find the man I'd seen previously and ask him in more detail about what he was up to. I was planning to be more aggressive, to get a better answer this time. Whether or not I was going to accuse him of being responsible for the chair arrangement the nights previous, I wasn't sure yet. But it never came to fruition, as the man was now apparently gone. As I looked around, I noticed three of the kids were still present, so I went over to them, asking where their parent or guardian had gone. Just as I asked, an older woman came to the table. She asked if there was a problem, and I replied by saying I wanted to speak to the man who had been with the kids. She gave me a strange look, before telling me that the group had not come with any men. I went on to describe the guy I had met, and she proceeded to inform me she had no idea who I was talking about. Alarm bells were ringing in my head, so I quickly apologized. Naturally, my attention instantly became less focused on the chair arrangement thing, and more on the fact that an unknown man was talking to a group of kids who he had no association with. Quickly, I notified my manager about the situation. She informed me to do a run-through of the indoor playground and eating area to see if I could locate him. I went and searched, but despite thoroughly checking every space an adult man could occupy over the course of a few minutes, I couldn't find him anywhere. Given the nature of our establishment, there's really not too many exits. The only door in and out, at least at the time I was employed there, besides the main entrance, were fire exits. They were all rigged with alarms that sounded when used. As the other staff were informed, however, including the person working front desk, they claimed they didn't see a man matching the description I gave, coming in or coming out. Despite the fast implementation of our safety policies, the man's actions really didn't warrant a response from law enforcement, so we didn't call. My manager informed me that she'd review the security tapes and ensure later day staff were aware of the man's appearance and to be on the lookout. We gifted a complimentary lunch package, consisting of two pizzas and a few snacks, plus a rebate, to the lady responsible for those three kids to apologize for the commotion. The matter was far less than settled in my mind. The man had disappeared, cleanly and without a trace, and while apparently inconsequential, it was incredibly off-putting for me. Where had he gone? Was he really related to the bizarre formations of chairs that kept cropping up? I wasn't sure. The day wore on with little other issues, and I went home that evening. I got the notification of my boss describing the man's appearance in the WhatsApp group we shared, just before my shift ended. I was a bit relieved, knowing the evening crew could be on the lookout. The following day, before I even entered the building, I decided to peer in through the glass. I was anxious about the chairs being present in that creepy little circle again, and to my relief, the floor appeared exactly as organized as it should have been. Entering the establishment and flicking on the lights, I saw no circle of chairs, so I relaxed a bit. I didn't quite know what to think regarding causality and whatnot. I instead opted to enjoy the fact that everything was as it should be. My morning progressed smoothly for about half an hour. I remember doing a once-over of the indoor playground floor and noting everything was in place. At a certain point, though, the music I was listening to was interrupted by a loud and annoying creaking sound of wood. First, I assumed it had been outside, or possibly next door. Our building is integrated with other businesses, after all. But as I continued my duties, the sound persisted, permeating the space I was in. While it sounded relatively muffled, I was able to localize it over the next few minutes as a handful of creaks continued. It didn't take long to realize it was directly under me. Our location did have a basement, one I was familiar with from hearing my boss speak of it. In my tenure, I'd never had a reason to go down into it, as it primarily served as a place for us to store replacement furniture and indoor playground hardware, namely pads and netting. The playground was designed in a modular fashion, so if pieces were damaged, they could be refitted in place, but that was typically done on the night shift. 
Hearing the sound of movement and dragging items beneath me was a bit unnerving. However, something else to note about the basement was that it was shared with the organizations next door. At the time, we had soft plastic dividers up and a few metal cages to indicate what space belonged to who. I was uneasy, but even so, I decided to head downstairs, as I figured a contractor or a new employee might have been using the space allocated to us. So I went and got the key, proceeding to the entrance. The door to the basement was at the very back of the kitchen and was always kept locked, so on the off chance a kid or patron wandered back there, they'd be unable to access it. When I got to the door, I noticed, with a drop in my stomach, it was ajar. Either the last person to grab something from storage had forgotten to lock it, or someone else had opened it, and was down there right now. Given the noises I heard, I was mentally leaning towards the ladder. I began to cautiously walk my way down the steps. I could hear more of the same creaking I heard upstairs, only it was much louder now. About halfway down the staircase, I decided to call out to see who exactly was there. Clearing my throat, I asked anybody downstairs to identify themselves, but I got no response. Instead, seconds later, the lights to the basement went out. Keep in mind, these were industrial fluorescent overheads. They weren't meant to ever be off, and as far as I currently know, the only way to turn them off is by using the breaker. They didn't have a dedicated switch. Naturally, I panicked on the inside. Being halfway down a staircase leading to an unknown person or persons, only for them to cut off the light when they knew I was there. Not good signs. That was enough for me to make me turn around and run back up the stairs. I had a feeling they were no worker at any of the nearby businesses. So I decided to dial the police, informing them that there might be an intruder at my place of work, hiding out in our basement. I locked the doorway down from the outside, patiently waiting for the police to arrive. Notably, there were no more noises from downstairs. They came pretty fast. I unlocked the door for them and let them down. Two officers inspected the place themselves. It took a while. Eventually, one of them came up and went back to the patrol car. A few minutes later, two other cop cars arrived. There were then a total of five officers going down into the basement. They weren't telling me anything concrete, but with the volume of police, I could only assume something pretty bad was down those stairs. After maybe 15 more minutes, I came to realize that wasn't the case. In fact, there was nothing of interest. Why three squad cars had come out was apparently due to the sheer size of the basement. They'd inspected the place extensively before informing me there was no intruder present, which I very much appreciated. Given how many businesses intersected that space, it seemed easy enough for somebody to have left without being caught, if they'd been down there when the officers showed. Following a modicum of paperwork, I informed my manager what had happened over a direct phone call. Really, I expected some scolding after I'd called emergency services for what seemed like no reason, but she was more or less understanding. If anything, she seemed to appreciate the security of the establishment seriously. So by then, the phone call was over and the police were gone. After finishing my morning duties, that bizarre incident in the basement staircase was itching at me. After a bit of deliberation, I decided to head back down into the space myself to take a look around. I don't really know why. I think I was probably trying to force myself into the creepiness so it would stop gnawing at me. I headed down. This time, the lights didn't turn off. I soon got to the bottom of the staircase and looked around the space. It was mostly normal, dusty indoor playground assets. But then, I saw it. Plain as day under the overhead fluorescent and completely unsuspecting. Seven of our outdated legacy chairs. They were centered in the section space to the left of the stairs, all organized into a perfect circle. I approached hesitantly, 
I felt a horrible sensation at the pit of my stomach. This was far too much, far too freaky to be coincidental. Someone had been there, and they'd organized the chairs like this. I didn't think they were there now, the police were too thorough, but someone had done this. And naturally, I could only assume it was the person responsible for the previous arrangements, the one I now believed to be the strange man I'd seen earlier. The fact he had apparently escaped without a trace that day seemed to allude to the idea he had slipped into our basement of all places. I didn't end up touching that array of chairs, but I did remove the item that sat in the center. This time, it was a small plastic hair clip. It was a bright magenta, and I could have easily assumed it belonged to the same child that the earrings did. I wish I could say something happened as I picked up the hair clip, but nothing did. The chairs remained unsuspecting, no movement, no sounds, just a heavy knot in my stomach that seemed to tighten as the item was removed. I headed upstairs, placing it in the lost and found drawer. There were still ten minutes to go, before I was to expect anyone else's arrival for the morning opening. And so I just kind of sat there and thought. Something just seemed bizarrely wrong about the entire thing. I remember proceeding about my day, almost like a zombie, trying to create some semblance of logical tracking in my mind to explain what happened. After that day, I ended up taking two sick days to finish out the week. I wasn't sure of it at the time, but this ended up turning into an extended hiatus, and eventually, I left the position, after I found something similar at a McDonald's with a play place. The events may sound minor to some, but they really did distract me from functioning in that work environment, to the point where I felt a switch-up would be best. Now, I did inform my manager about this in a lengthy email that ironically never got a reply, but my theory was, I believe that strange, not-so-talkative man was responsible for the chair formations. I think he'd either been using the key or some other access door to stay overnight in the storage space, so he could move those chairs around. How, and more interestingly why, I cannot say. As for the ever-increasing size of the chair rings and the little kid accessories I'd find in the middle, I remain completely confused in what they were and what they symbolized. My partner, who I told the story to, seems adamant it was ritualistic in nature. But I don't know. I didn't end up staying in touch with anyone from that position, and I never found out if anything more came of it. Forest Ranger Danger from 33 Trader It's been about five years now since the strange events that caused me to quit my job as Forest Ranger up in the Pacific Northwest. I'd been working seasonally for the Forest Service for a few years at that point. Most of the time, it was great. I loved spending so much time outdoors, exploring new trails and helping visitors but the night that things went sideways was a night I'll never forget. I was stationed up near Mount Baker at the time. Our ranger station was a couple miles off the highway, nestled right up against the edge of the National Forest. We'd get a pretty good flow of hikers and campers coming through during the summer. My job consisted of a mix between running the front desk, leading nature walks, enforcing rules, and generally keeping an eye on things. One night in late August, I was scheduled to take the midnight patrol shift. Basically, driving through campsites and along trails, making sure everything was quiet and there weren't any problems. I always liked the night patrols, cruising under the stars through the tall pines with a thermos of coffee. Besides the occasional rowdy group of teenagers, it was peaceful. When I headed out at midnight that night, it was clear skies and about 60 degrees out. Perfect weather for camping. I drove slow with my window down, listening to the sounds of the forest. About 45 minutes into my patrol, I was on a narrow dirt road, which runs between the south campsites and main hiking trail. This road has a few pull-offs, where you can park and access the trail, but it's mostly used by rangers and is gated off at night. 
As I approached one of the pull-offs around 1am, I spotted a truck parked sideways across the road, completely blocking it. The headlights were still on, doors open, but no one was inside. I parked behind it and got out to take a look. No keys, no cell phone left behind. After checking the plates, it was registered to a man from Seattle who had a reservation for one of the nearby campsites. I was getting an odd feeling about the whole thing. I grabbed my flashlight and headed onto the nearby trail to make sure the driver had not gotten hurt. This trail leads uphill, with the forest getting pretty dense. I called out a few times, but didn't hear anything back. After about 10 minutes, I turned back, planning to radio another ranger for help. As I walked down the hill toward the road, that's when the beam of my flashlight landed on something at the edge of the trail. There was what looked to be a small pile of clothes lying on top of the underbrush. I leaned closer and realized it was a child, a young girl maybe seven or eight years old. She was lying on her side, eyes closed, wearing pajamas. She looked as if she was sleeping. I knelt down beside her, completely confused, trying to understand how a kid could be alone out here in the middle of the night. I reached out to gently shake her shoulder. That's when I froze. As my hand touched her, the girl's eyes shot open, but there was something wrong. Her eyes were entirely black. No iris, no whites, just a void. In that same instant, before I could react, the girl let out an inhuman shriek, piercing the silence of the forest. I scrambled back, blinded by my flashlight beam reflecting off her retinas. The scream lasted several seconds, reverberating through the trees. Then it cut off abruptly. When I looked up again, she was sitting up and staring right at me with those pure black eyes. Slowly, the girl stood up on the trail. She was tiny, couldn't have been more than three and a half feet tall, but the look on her face was one of utter contempt, like the stare of an adult who utterly despises you. Then she spoke. The voice that came out sounded young, but also too articulate, too low-pitched for that of a child that age. This place is not for you, she said. Leave now. I was absolutely paralyzed, looking into those empty voids where her eyes should have been. She blinked once, and when her eyelids opened again, her eyes were normal. This girl then turned and walked into the forest, quickly disappearing between the trees before I could say a word. I scrambled up, sprinting back down the trail to my truck, nearly twisting my ankle, stumbling over roots and rocks. I drove back down the road and radioed the situation in an absolute panic. The other ranger on duty thought I was playing some kind of prank at first, but he knew me well enough to hear the fear in my voice and know I was serious. I met him back at the ranger's station. We went to the campsites of the truck owner I'd looked up. An older couple and their young granddaughter were staying there. They had no idea that the truck was gone, insisting they had locked it and had both sets of keys. The girl they had with them appeared totally normal. No signs of that entity I'd encountered on the trail. Still, I couldn't bring myself to fully explain what I'd seen. The other ranger and I searched the woods and kept watch on the campsite, but no other clues emerged. In the morning, the truck was still there where I'd found it. I quit working for the Forest Service about two weeks later. No matter how much I tried to put the event at the back of my mind, a new crawling fear took hold of me. Day or night, but especially after dark, a creeping feeling of dread and terror accompanied me on patrols. I just couldn't continue patrolling those woods alone after that. I had no interest in finding out what that thing was either. As long as it's a different area, I still go camping and hiking all the time. Whatever that presence was in the forest, I think it wanted me gone, and I'm not about to ignore that 
kind of warning. DoorDash Thing from Darren M. It was about three years ago. I was delivering food in a rural area right outside of town. I still think back on it sometimes when I'm driving down a dark country road late at night. At the time, I was working for DoorDash to make some extra cash on top of my 9-to-5 office job. The money wasn't too bad for part-time work, and I enjoyed cruising around listening to podcasts. Most of the deliveries were to houses in suburban neighborhoods or apartment complexes, but every once in a while, I'd get an order going out to a more rural address. It was a Saturday night around 11 p.m. when I got pinged to pick up an order from a 24-hour diner that would be delivered to a house a good 15 miles away. It seemed really far, but I was pretty sure the delivery radius was decided by the restaurants or whatever, and the tip alone was 20 bucks, so I figured it was worth the drive. The trip would apparently take me down a winding country road outside of town that I was not familiar with. There was barely any moonlight as I turned off the main highway and headed down this pitch black road. No streetlights either, just my headlights cutting through absolute darkness. The houses out there were few and far between. Mostly it was just fields, trees, and the occasional dirt road or driveway. I had been driving for about 10 minutes when the directions told me I still had three miles to go. The road hadn't passed any houses in quite a while. The woods were thick on either side, and I hadn't even seen another car for miles. I was just thinking I should turn on some upbeat music when I came around a bend and I had to slam on my brakes. Because there was something in the middle of the road. I glimpsed it for just a split second in my headlights. Sounds crazy, but it looked like a huge dog or wolf standing over some kind of carcass. But as the glare of my headlights lit it up, the creature's eyes shone back red. Then the thing turned and in a flash bounded into the woods on two legs in just about two leaps. My heart was absolutely pounding. I threw the car into reverse and sped backwards down the road to get the heck out of Dodge. Once I felt safely far enough away, I pulled over and turned the car around. I sat there, trying to slow my breathing, processing what I'd seen. That was no normal wolf, coyote, or dog. The thing was massive, almost the size of a person with hulking shoulders, and the way it turned to look at me was too deliberate, too intelligent. I debated canceling the order and heading home, but there was a house waiting for this food and I didn't want to leave them hanging. So I continued the drive, far more cautiously than before. The last couple of miles I was gripping the steering wheel tight, straining my eyes for any sign of that creature. Finally I reached the small driveway leading off into the woods. I pulled up to the modest single-story home and knocked on the door. An older man answered, graciously accepting his food. He apologized for making me come all the way out there as he handed me a nice cash tip. I made sure to ask him if he'd seen any strange animals lately. The man frowned and said he knew there were some coyotes and wolves out there, but they tended to keep their distance from people. Now, I was creeped out and I felt like talking about it would help me deal with it. So I went ahead and told him what I saw on the way there. When I described it, his expression changed to concern. He suggested I report the sighting to animal control and be extra safe driving home. The entire way back I was scanning the darkness, jumping at every hint of movement. I couldn't stop thinking about the creature's eyes reflecting the light, how unnatural and menacing it seemed. The image was burned into my mind. As soon as I got back into town, where there were streetlights and businesses, I pulled over and canceled my remaining orders for the night. My hands were still shaking a bit as I started driving home. I ended up calling out of my shift the next day. There was no way I could focus on office work. 
That made me realize I didn't get paid nearly enough by DoorDash to deal with deliveries on remote backroads in the pitch black. I decided to avoid orders that would take me too far out of town. I did contact Animal Control. They confirmed no other reports of a wolf or coyote that big. I still wonder what it was. And I'm also worried that it's still lurking out there along those rural roads. But it's not my problem anymore because I'm not going to be driving out there anytime soon. There's always something watching. From Alex S. I have a couple of stories I can share relating to strange and creepy experiences that I've had at two separate jobs. My first story takes place during my last semester at the university I previously attended. I won't name the university itself, but you do need to know that it was on the smaller side, and it's a private, diocesan university. There's a seminary on campus, along with a house for religious brothers, and I think there's a place for the nuns and sisters to stay. Every once in a while, you'd even see the nuns walking this big black dog around campus. There are several buildings on campus now, but the original building is still standing. I had the unpleasant experience of staying on a fourth floor dorm in 2021, just a few months before the building itself turned 100 years old. There were always rumors that these dorms were haunted, but I hadn't believed them until my own experience changed my mind. These dorm rooms were single rooms, meaning no roommates as the rooms were wildly small. And with it being almost 100 years old at the time, these were the original dorms to the school meaning a lot of life, both good and bad, has gone through here. The stairs themselves had a curve in them from the years of foot traffic. I had been going through a rough patch at the time, and I'll be brutally honest. My headspace was nothing but depressing. If you know anything about spirits and the paranormal, it is believed that your negative energy makes you more vulnerable to them. However, I had decided to stick things out to see how the semester went, before making any changes to my life. I busied myself with schoolwork and worked two jobs. One of my jobs was a work study at campus safety, and the other being off campus at a convenience store down the road. Now, there weren't many of us staying on the fourth floor, so the hallway was usually dark. Thankfully, my room was right across from the toilets and showers, so that part was always illuminated by the lights. Due to my class schedule, I worked the closing shift at the convenience store, usually Friday through Saturday, meaning I wouldn't get back to my dorm until around 11.30 to 11.45 p.m. On those nights, the only light coming into the hall was that from the bathroom area and the faint lights from the sidewalks outside. One particular night, after a seemingly long shift at the store, I made my way back to my dorm room and I felt strange walking into my specific hallway down towards my room. I didn't think anything of this at first, chalking it up to my feelings of homesickness and loneliness. Before going to bed, I decided to take a shower to relax and brush off the stress of the day. When I left my room and before going across the hall, I looked down towards the opposite end of the hallway. I swore I saw someone standing and looking out the window. I didn't see a face or body, but a shadow. I blinked a few times, and it was gone. I played it off as a trick of the light and my overworked mind. After my shower, when I walked back into my room, I looked down the hall again and still saw nothing, but I did feel an overwhelming sense of being watched. Later on, when I was getting ready to go to bed, I used the sink in my room, and the water went from clear to brown, then back to clear again in an instant. This wasn't the first time it happened. I just told myself it was old plumbing. However, a few weeks after the incident, I googled the myths surrounding this old building, and I was a bit creeped out to find that bloody water was one of the more prominent myths. Fast forward a few weeks after this incident occurred. I was back home for fall break, and I couldn't have been more grateful to be back. My mental health had really taken a toll, and I was glad to have a break from my daily stressors back at school. One night while spending time with my mom and sister, 
we got on the topic of my strange experience at the dorm. We decided to bring out the Ouija board, which isn't one of my proudest moments. My fellow paranormal and spiritual people will probably either cringe at my decision to partake in this, or be intrigued to hear about what happened. We believe we came into contact with what we were told was the spirit that I saw that night. Whether that's true or not, I'm not sure. From what this supposed spirit told us, he had been a student at the university, specifically a seminary student. Sadly, he told us that he had ended his own life, as his sexuality was discovered by his higher-ups, and he was to face the consequences of it. The spirit claimed that the university had covered up all information about his death, which would make sense considering they would want to keep that information sealed to protect their reputation. He claimed he knew and felt my loneliness and sadness and didn't want me to feel that way anymore. He also said I had to leave the university in order to get past these feelings. Whether or not this information was true, considering you never know who you're talking to on the other side of the board, I did end up leaving the university after finishing the semester, and it did greatly improve my mental health. I believe the spirit still watches over me from time to time as well, as I still have the key to the very room where I felt I'd hit rock bottom. I hope that one day they uncover more information that may solidify and validate this spirit's death. My next story takes place only a few months after leaving my university. I was taking a break from school and working at the same convenience store as before. I worked on the floor of the store, essentially meaning guest service. I encountered a lot of people during the day. One thing that was a big deal for us to do when interacting with guests was to make eye contact. I've never had an issue with this, and I found it to be a skill that comes easy to me. One day while working the front counter, I had a man come to my register. He seemed to be a businessman, dressed in a dark suit with his hair gelled to one side. A very clean-cut man. However, when I first said hello and made eye contact with him, there was something different about his eyes. Something unsettling. They weren't piercing, but they were somehow a bright blue-gray tone. And his smile was extraordinarily white, with perfect teeth. Overall, his features just seemed too perfect to be real. I continued to make eye contact with him throughout our interaction, but every time he looked at me, it was as if he was looking through me or trying to look deep into my mind. I felt uncomfortable the whole time, and even for some time after interacting with the man. He would continue to come into the store every other day or so for about two weeks. Somehow, he'd always end up at my register, even during our busy rushes. Each time, he would flash this unsettling smile and greet me with a low, Hello, Alex, as if he had known me personally. It wasn't strange for guests to call me by my name, as I did wear a name tag for my uniform. One day, he said to me, Tell me, Alex, are you religious? And I proceeded to tell him that I didn't want to answer that question. I guess it wasn't weird for guests to hand us religious handouts or leave them in the store, but I've never been specifically asked about my own beliefs. He simply nodded his head and told me to have a good day, with this unsettling smirk. The very last day I interacted with him, he began with the same, Hello Alex, as he always did. At this point, I just wanted the interaction to go as quickly as possible. Well, it did go by quickly and smoothly, to my surprise, but that may have been my own personal unease and due to the fact that he was becoming a regular visitor. It had gone on without any strange comments as well, which only made it all the more unsettling somehow. Just as he was about to leave, he turned back to me and proceeded to say, There's always someone watching. He then pointed upward, and was looking at what seemed to be right behind me. I was on edge for weeks about this last interaction, and likely should have taken it more seriously than I did. However, I don't believe he was referring to anything remotely human. Rather, he was referring to something that was out of this world. And part of me believes that he himself was not from this world. I get goosebumps typing this out, 
It's the first time I've ever told this experience. I haven't even shared it with my family. Tales from the Break Room is a viewer-submitted podcast featuring allegedly true scary stories that happened on the way to, on the way from, or at work. If you want your story to be narrated on the show, send it to us at eeriecast.com slash submit. As of April 14th, we're paying three cents per word for stories that are approved and make it onto the show. Submission does not guarantee approval or payment. For a limited time only, PayPal only. Tales from the Break Room is an EerieCast Network original podcast hosted by Darkness Prevails. You can follow him on Twitter at Dark Prevails, and you can hear thousands more stories read by him on our other show, Unexplained Encounters. If you enjoyed this episode, please follow and rate Tales from the Break Room on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. You can also enjoy plenty more horror-themed podcasts at EerieCast.com. <laughs>